Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for your time joining us today. Um, today is our second masterclass. Um, it's on molten bath engineering. Um, quickly about me, uh, if you haven't met me before or been to our webinars before, my name is Ben Hogg. Um, I'm a pyrometallurgist with the Isa Smelt team at Glencore Technology. Um, but my history is uh, a long time in operations up at Mount Isa in the copper smelter there. So I stayed there for 13 years and I did a lot of roles there, uh, metallurgist, operations superintendent, uh, metallurgy superintendent. Um, so today's webinar will be given from that perspective, from an operations perspective. The plan with this one, similar to last time, is, is a short presentation by myself, and then I'll hand over um, for some Q&A with my colleagues. So as we go, put your questions in the chat, and uh, Stanko and Oscar will be there to answer those shortly. Um, we'll cover the topic definition shortly, um, but linking back to our previous masterclass that was on uh, feed preparation, um, so what we saw there was that uh, steady and a known feed is really critical um, to optimal furnace operation. So today is really about how do we predict and ac accurately evaluate the impact to the molten bath of any changes to our feed. So why is molten bath engineering important? Firstly, what is it? Um, well, my definition is the ability to accurately and repeatedly predict and control what will happen in your molten bath under various conditions. Uh, and in particular, conditions that uh, you don't often run under or you've never run under before. And the reasons for that um, are around um, recovery, safety, cost effectiveness, um, those sorts of things, which we'll also cover. So it's important to know uh, when your furnace operating window is about to change. Um, and there's two main reasons there. Um, a feed change, so you're getting a, a new material um, or some of your existing materials or even your fluxes might be changing in composition. Um, and the second reason there is a new constraint in the plant. Um, so that might be an upstream or a downstream operational issue. Um, usually in the form of a bottleneck, um, you know, off gas volume is restricted, the composition um, is constrained, there's an issue with oxygen supply, these sorts of things. Uh, could be some of your equipment's not functioning properly, um, or it has to be bypassed for maintenance, um, or it could be a limitation within your furnace itself. Um, so for whatever reason, you have a maximum temperature or a feed rate that you need to stay under for a certain period of time. Um, you've lost some volume due to accretion in the furnace, those sorts of things. Now, this is based on my experience and I, I hope some of the people out there in an operations environment can, uh, can agree with me here, um, but how does a change to the furnace operating window commonly occur? Um, so we have a, a plant manager or someone like that asking us, can we treat this new feed? Uh, can we operate the furnace differently to help with some issue? Okay. Uh, if you have a more assertive manager, they might ask, how much of this new feed can we treat? How far can we push the furnace in a new operating direction? And if you have a even more assertive manager, they might say, tell me why we can't do this new feed, treat this new feed. Um, why can't we operate in this position. Uh, so these questions you might be familiar with, they seem a little bit trivial, um, but they really influence um, how we might feel obliged as plant metallurgists uh, to respond to that. Here are some typical responses from my um, experience. So, you know, looking at historical plant data, um, doing some lab experiments if we have the time, um, quickly checking some existing literature, um, pulling out the procedure and quoting some things from there, 
Um, or in the end, it might be, well, let's just trial it in the plant. Um, so you can see based on the question asked and uh, I guess what responses you're able to make, you might select a less than optimal approach here. Um, but the main point is, are any of these approaches, approaches ideal at all? And here's some concerns with these. Um, so historical plant data, uh, if you're moving outside your general operating window, you're really looking at extrapolating. Um, and where you're extrapolating from or to, um, maybe old data, it may be irre irrelevant data. Um, so the furnace was operating under different conditions. Um, you know, we're looking at copper loss um, when we were running a completely different slag um, or different uh, oxygen partial pressure conditions. Um, experiments, as I mentioned before, often time consuming, they can be expensive. And for our high temperature applications, it can be very difficult to replicate um, those conditions uh, in the lab. Um, and some, sometimes the furnace conditions in the lab don't scale up well. So you might see some issues in the lab that are to do with size or design of the lab furnace rather than the, the chemistry or whatever you're trying to test. Checking literature, a um, little bit similar to extrapolation. So you might not get perfectly relevant literature. Um, it may be under different conditions, oversimplified conditions. Um, and it's, it's insufficient to define what we're trying to do often. Procedures. Um, so to this, to me, this really means following or developing limits um, ratios, rules of thumb, these sorts of things. And it can be placed on minor impurities, it can be placed on slag formers, um, and it can be placed on, you know, whether it's a sulfide or an oxide material or a reductant. Um, the issue with this is they don't adequately model the system. Um, you end up with very restrictive conditions. Um, and uh, what, what ends up happening is, uh, you run a trial, uh, something doesn't quite work and we, and we decide to bring the limits even tighter. Um, so you, you remove your flexibility to treat different feeds um, or run in different windows. And the last one's plant trials. So um, they can be risky You're using your full operating plant to do a trial. Uh, they're often very reactive. So you're putting it through um, in slow steps and seeing what happens. Um, you can end up, end up in a suboptimal window. Um, and there's potential, of course, to misinterpret what's happening uh, if you don't understand uh, the basics behind it before you start. So what are the outcomes from these type of approaches um, to, do it, to moving your operating window? So the general result is you end up with significant and continual um, changes required after you've moved the operating window. So you're already operating the plant. Um, and you're still trying to optimize things, check things, uh, change things. Um, and it reduces your confidence to move outside your normal operating window uh, in future or even at the time. The risks with this, um, the obvious ones, safety, production, and recovery can be compromised um, while you're trying to find that optimum uh, window and operating conditions. Um, and the other risk is you don't understand uh, what you're doing. So you, you continue on in this suboptimal um, space um, or you unnecessarily restrict yourself um, during this trial or in future um, moves of the operating window. So how do we mitigate these risks? Let's look at what we traditionally do uh, when we're uh, changing the furnace operating window um, based on the previous few slides. So we, I'll use the example of a new feed material. So we perform some checks on the new feed material. Um, we purchase and start treating the new feed material. We collect and review some plant data. And of course, we're trying to be very quick doing that so we can uh, see what's going on and make some changes. 
we make these changes, they're likely suboptimal. Um, we make some conclusions from there and adjust the furnace operation. Um, and usually either a long way into the change or even after the change, we've got enough plant data and enough knowledge from the exercise to actually evaluate the impact of that new feed properly. What we'd ideally like to do um, is, is this full evaluation at the start. Um, so before you even purchase, receive, um, or blend the feed. So how can we follow um, this better approach? We want the capability to perform this accurate evaluation um, of the changes we expect in the bath before they occur. Which is very nice to say, but uh, how do we do that? Um, so a couple of ways, we have a, we have a customized and or verified database, um, relevant one to our furnace, but also to our operation. What I mean by that is, are we copper smelting, lead smelting, nickel smelting, that sort of thing. Um, have a simple and easily integrated software um, or tool that you can use this database um, so that it's accessible to uh, people on the plant and they can do evaluations um, and problem solving uh, on a daily basis. And then we need competent metallurgists trained to use the software and the tool and understand its potential and limits. Um, so the reason um, for that point is that you really need to understand you know, the thermodynamics and the chemistry behind the tool um, so you can interpret the results properly. Uh, you know if it's you know spitting out an error, those sorts of things. Now, if you've watched some of our webinars or presentations before, um, you know that Glencore technology, we, one of the systems we like to use or the tools is called MPE, multi-phase equilibria. Um, few reasons we like that, uh, it integrates well with Excel. Um, so a lot of plant metallurgists will be familiar with Excel, doing a lot of other calculations, um, checks in Excel. Um, also MPE is relatively easy to use, um, learn and interpret the results. Um, and for our process, the eyes are smelt uh, and different smelting, copper, lead, nickel smelting, the results are very reliable. Um, so we can, uh, we can base some predictions on those very confidently. We do use other databases. Um, so we do use FactSage. Um, we do uh, use data from our lab laboratory, our pilot plant, our demo scale results. Um, but we also try to verify all these, all these results um, with industrial plant operating data. Um, so that helps within Glencore. We've got access to those plants um, that Glencore owns. So we can, we can check and refine our databases based on this. So now what we're hoping to do um, is the ideal approach um, to changing our furnace operating window. Um, and our molten bath, um, which is evaluate the new feed accurately, optimize the furnace window, identify any knock-on effects, um, prepare a plan to manage all this, and then make adjustments or refinements um, to the plan and also to the operation before we treat this new feed or before we change this operating window. Um, and then your final points there become confirming what you've predicted, making some minor tweaks and really monitoring the operation to make sure you stay in that optimal window. So let's go through a hypothetical worked example. Um, this one's about increasing MGO levels uh, in our copper smelter feed, resulting in more MGO in our slag. Um, so this is all uh, hypothetical what I'm about to cover now. So let's say we have to change the main feed to the furnace and it results in 2.6% MGO in the blended feed up considerably um, from, what we're, from what our average is of 1.1. 1 
the old way, check out the procedure. It says stay below 2% MGO. Um, obviously not very helpful and very restrictive in this case. So if we follow this, we either have to drop the feed rate while we uh, put some of the high MGO material aside. Um, and we may not know how long that's going to last. Um, so we really need a better answer to that. We can look at some previous data. Um, so this is the historical approach. Um, here I've made up some numbers. So there's our MGOs in the feed and there's the operating temps we ran at. We look at the historical data. We want to run way out here at 2.6, so a long way from where we are. We look at the literature and it says, okay, the, the furnace operating temperature is likely um, to increase exponentially as your MGO goes up. All very nice, but we really don't know where we're heading here, um, given the data we've got and given the window we want to move to. So what should we do? Still a few more options. We can do nothing. We can run how we normally run. We'll end up probably with a more viscous slag um, in training some more of our metal in that slag, having higher copper losses and also some other impacts within the plant. So a thicker slag, which is harder to tap. Knowing that we might decide, let's increase the operating temperature. Um, we could end up with some more refractory wear and, and other knock-on impacts, uh, such as using less recycle or more fuel. Um, but if we do use a tool like MPE to review some options, we can evaluate the slag chemistry, which means adjusting some of our um, fluxing targets or ratios. Um, we can adjust also some of our other um, items that impact slag chemistry, so oxygen potential, bath temperature at the same time. Um, so we can run all these scenarios through um, before we actually treat the material. So some results. Um, if we're aiming to maintain a similar slag viscosity uh, for an ISO smelt, say, and a similar operating temperature, um, we might try increasing the MAC grade. And if you watch that chart on the right, um, you'll see what happens there. We can move slowly down towards the left. Um, so lower temperatures and lower viscosities. We might increase our lime fluxing. Um, keep an eye on the graph on the right again, and you can see the impact of that. And now we understand what's helping. We can really optimize the, the silicate of iron and, and the lime as well. Um, so there's a few uh, options we're left with there um, to move our slag chemistry around and uh, really help give us some flexibility for operating the furnace. So a common question, which I'll address at the time, um, is why don't I just keep adding more CAO um, if it helps my slag so much? Um, and the simple answer is, <clears throat> pardon me, The simple answer is, it's not that easy. Um, <clears throat> so it'll depend on what level of lime you've already got in the slag uh, and what the other components in the slag are. Um, and in the copper smelting case, you could have five or more other components in the slag that are influencing your slag chemistry. <clears throat> so once we've selected that optimal slag, um, we can also have a look at the knock-on effects um, all within MPE. Um, so we can see um, what that high MAC grade might mean in terms of tonnage for downstream processes and, and cycle times. Um, we can have a, an idea of what requirements might change for oxygen, fuel, coolant, flux, these sorts of things. Um, but a very interesting one is the distribution of minor metals. Um, so that's, that's not linear with feed composition, um, although you can often get away with assuming that, but it certainly say it changes very drastically um, with your slag chemistry and your operating conditions. So it's something you need to check after you've chosen a optimal slag um, is certainly where my distribution of minor impurities is. Okay, so we've got a bit of a plan. 
Um, the feed hasn't arrived yet conveniently. So we're gonna go review with the rest of the team and we can always go back and refine that plan. Um, so we have that ability now. We can test refinements and we can optimize the plan before this feed arrives, um, which, is, which is really much preferred to those uh, other approaches we spoke about earlier. So why has GT developed this capability? Um, there's a few reasons. Um, one's really based on the ISIS network technology. Um, so it's built to be flexible and robust. What that means is lots of our clients use their furnace, a uh, single furnace to treat a wide range of feeds. Um, so all sorts of types, concentrates, scraps, recycles, etc. <clears throat> but also different feed sizes, different feed compositions and lots of various operating conditions um, from reducing all the way up oxidizing. Um, and this is so they can make a healthy margin as a furnace operator. Um, and Stanko and Oscar will probably cover some of those examples in the Q&A. Um, the molten high temperature and very well agitated bath in the furnace is close to equilibrium. Um, so what that means is we can use equilibrium as a very close estimate of what's happening in the furnace. So those predictions I just showed you and the calculations become a lot easier um, if you can um, ignore or um, rely less on the kinetics and more on the equilibrium. The isosmelt has a small bath um, and it responds very quickly and predictably to changes. Um, so if you make a change, you can see it sooner. Um, but also if you make a mistake, um, you can uh, repair that quicker as well. Um, so it's quite easy to see the effects of changes you're making and confirm uh, what you're trying to predict with your, with your MPE or other software models. And when we do get a lot of requests, um, in this sort of space, um, internal and external people asking us for assistance. Um, we've applied this knowledge and this approach to Weiser smelt furnaces, but also other furnaces. Um, and really what's, what's grown this is our team, which is a combination of designers, um, operational people or people with a long operational background and also experts in the fundamentals of the furnace of the thermodynamics and the slag chemistry. So I hope that gave you some food for thought, um, triggers a few questions. I'm gonna hand over now um, to Stanko and Oscar. They're gonna to attempt to uh, answer the questions that are, that are coming through. So I'll hand over to them now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Muchas gracias. Um, we, I would like, uh, like to introduce everyone uh, to our poll now is we are launching uh, a poll please answer the question it's very important for us have a feedback from what you are seeing here and what else you want to see and the next steps now talking about the specifically about the matters of the bat smelting technology i would like to introduce myself um, i am oscar i work uh, for a long time in in South America, specifically in Chile. Um, in Chile, we have seven smelters, seven copper smelters, plus some steel ones. And over these smelters, we, we have the same issues what uh, uh, Ben is talking about. I, in particular, I, I work in Alto Norte, which is a custom, custom smelter, one million ton per year of concentrate capacity. And my one of my roles over four years was um, do the concentrate evaluation. And basically what Ben described as a typical questions when the traders, the traders call you and say how much we can put, how much further we can push the furnace to feed some specific concentrate feed or even reverts. Um, we take this traditional approach or a trial and error approach, which is okay, let's buy a trial lot 
the traders make the decision they want about the trial lot size. And then we do a, a, a trial protocol or plan to basically feed a little bit with some precaution to do not blow out the furnace. And basically we end up with a conclusion as Ben said, can be optimal or non-optimal, we never know. And also we end up with some limitation or caps. We said, okay, we can process until 3%, 5% of this material of the feed. And, and the, the option to try to call someone or even if having seven smelters in the country, you call to your colleagues and they give you pretty much the same answer you already no, it's okay, let's see, try and see how much you can chuck in. Um, that is in simple words from my experience and that is why I, I believe the trial and error approach can work, but this is far away from the optimal to move and, and maximize the business of this method. Excellent, uh, thanks Oscar. Uh, also to introduce myself, uh, my name is Stanko Nikolic. I look after the Hydromat and Pyromat businesses here at Glencore Technology. And uh, welcome to our session. I think one of the things is Oscar highlighted uh, for his experience that, that this presentation has highlighted. I think for mine, I, I sort of look back at, at my career and uh, being based at different sites. And one of them, I was in the role of uh, a plant metallurgist looking after the feed preparation area and similar sort of thing. There was a stockpile of concentrate that was on site there and uh, that, that had been trialed. They tried to put uh, you know, that small percentage through mm -hmm. and uh, the feedback from the operations was, oh no, this, this made the furnace operation too difficult. And so then they just parked that uh, 20,000 ton stockpile of concentrate there on site and, and it sat there. Uh, but then, you know, when you, you go on site and you see these things, it then lets you to ask the questions as to, well, what, what happened there? Uh, we're able to use the, the metallurgy that, that uh, metallurgical tools that we have to be able to look at analyzing, hey, what's going on here? Look, from the slag chemistry perspective, treating this material is fine, but really it's the conversations you have. Uh, with the operations team that are key. And I guess what was the outcome from that was that the issue operations had was that the, they, they had this perception the top of the furnace was, was getting cold when treating this material. And therefore we could rejig how things were running to the furnace in terms of the feeds to make sure we maximize those temperatures at the top space of the furnace. And we could do that through our thermodynamic models as well. And that led them to be able to treat that full stockpile and then continue to take that material. Uh, in the future, which was really a high value uh, concentrate and really highlighted the advantage of using these tools when it comes to helping a site really understand well, what are the limits and, and what can they, they push uh, within that sort of aspect. So I think yeah, it really does highlight to us the importance that we have uh, for this type of software in our systems and also to then look at, well, what is it that you can also do? So I might, uh, pass back to, to you, Oscar, to sort of uh, have a think about, well, in, in your circumstance, I mean, what were the other ways that you'd reach out to institutions or colleagues to, to sort of sort out, well, you know, what can we treat these materials and what other aspects were there that, that were considered um, from that yeah. perspective? Yeah, I have another experience similar to what Stanko uh, mm. said, but wasn't in South America, was here in Australia. Mm. When pretty much the same, but was in a, another argument to mm -hmm. cap a specific concentrate. Mm -hmm. At that moment they said, yeah, we can process this con, but up to certain percentage, mm -hmm. because we got a form over mm -hmm. related with that. Mm -hmm. and, and they say, okay, a, a proper, um, I would say incident investigation mm -hmm. was done and end up with a conclusion to blaming the con. Mm. It's the easy one. Okay, mm. let's put off this cone. Oh, is. We are we'll fine if we don't process this uh, overseas cone, for example. Mm. Um, yeah, in the real life, they will have a very small cap. The problem was the trader got a commitment to buy in a higher rate when we consume. Mm. 
and we got a massive stockpile growing up, growing up. I cannot remember the numbers now, but it was around 25,000 tons, maybe, mm. uh, with a lot of copper, which we pay for that. And we pay for a copper to have this copper sitting in the background. And at the end of the day, we, I, I review the case. I say, guys, it's no matter of the con. Then we have a tool to evaluate. Mm. In this specific experience, I show them there is no issue with the slack. The only issue can be just the, the heat balance. Mm. That should be your real limitation. And we end up increasing the, the cap four times mm. from 5% around to 20%. And I was very really glad um, a few weeks ago when I took uh, with the metallurgy superintendent and I asked, hey, how much you are putting? I said, yeah, 20, 25%, it's fine. And mm -hmm. um, we are processing a lot of external corn over there and it's a good experience. And also uh, we have a good, uh, a good question over the, mm -hmm. the chat from Alexander. Uh, sorry, Alexander, I cannot pronounce your surname, mm -hmm. but um, he's talking about uh, what about to have an in situ um, analyzer. And to be honest, uh, I am a fan of the in situ analyzers. Yeah, in the Noranda reactor technology, uh, in Glencore, we have two operations running with this technology. When we basically, we don't have an on site analyzer like next to the tapping hole, but we have a pneumatic system. When someone takes the slack sample, putting in a pneumatic uh, little transporter and go to the lab, literally an alarm pop up in the, in the lab, say like an um, ambulance mm. and one of the lab run, the lab operator run, take the sample and give you the side in like 10 minutes before the people take it from hot to get the numbers 10 to 15 minutes. I am really a fan uh, of this activity. Yeah, but also it's a reactive, yeah. And we can spend time to have the most faster turnaround, turnaround time. But at the end of the day, you're still reactive. And the risk from my experience is when you have your high technology XRF calibrated for a specific range, and then you introduce another field with high NGO, for example, and you don't have the, the lab, the XRF calibrated for this operation, you know, for this amount of uh, uh, this element. And then you can not rely in the, even in the lab aside, because the calibration code was done, just following the, the um, Ben's example, the calibration curve of the equipment can be done between one to 2%. And we are going to push now to two and a half percent. And the lab people will tell you, yeah, I don't know. I have to recalibrate my equipment to give you a proper answer. That is why I have a tool like MPE or another one, which is, can be similar, can give you, it's very useful. But I am still a fan of the, a good in situ analyzer. And for me, it is the way to operate a smelter. Mm. Have a good prediction and a good um, reactions if something go wrong. Mm. Because you can have the better prediction, but if someone in the paper area, area prepare the wrong recipe and put an extra bucket of something, uh, you have to be able to, you need to be able to react mm. quick enough um, to change your parameters and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, in this space, um, in my past life, we, our control room operators change the spec 100, 120 times a day. Mm. Yeah, it's a very fine tuning mm. uh, because we have no that prediction tool. Um, but it's a short answer. Good, it's a fun, but one doesn't replace the other. Mm. Oh, excellent. Yeah. All right, I'll take the next question that we have here. So this one is from uh, Christoph Susha. So his question is uh, relating to the implementation, so about magnesia, and he wanted to know if GT had developed uh, an add-on or a competence to look at the slag or refractory interactions 
especially if there's high amounts of spinels formed. Uh, so I'll take this question. Uh, when we look at uh, what we've done with uh, this package and applying it to different sites, uh, I guess a key example is one that I'll bring from uh, the, the Glencore group where we had one of our sites which was uh, having some issues in terms of the fact that they had a lot of variability in their feed. They were getting different amounts of concentrates coming in from the various concentrators around the region and uh, they weren't able to blend the magnesia and the alumina through the blends to get one smooth consistent blend. And so what that ended up happening is that they had that variability in magnesia coming into the furnace itself. And so uh, to deal with that, the operators then lifted the operating temperature and held it constant to be able to avoid any issues to do with you know, excessive spinel or as magnetite as it would be in the copper smelter formation uh, within the actual slag itself. Now, what that then meant was operationally, the plant was running better, uh, but when it came to the furnace integrity, uh, we saw that there was an elevated dissolution of the refractory in that case. Uh, so both Ben and uh, myself came to that site and then worked with the metallurgical team. Uh, we, we introduced them this, this tool that Ben has demonstrated. And we then taught the, went through our training program to be able to give them the information and tools to then make decisions themselves. Uh, so then they were able to look at that magnesia coming in and then change the operating temperature target, uh, working together with their operations team as well to be able to get that feedback from the furnace to be able to know whether or not uh, that what we were predicting in the models was matching reality. And what we saw with that implementation was that we were able to get the refractory life uh, to, or the refractory wear uh, to come back to a minimum. So if uh, you're interested in more details about this work, uh, we published a paper at the TMS 2019 conference and you can read about it all there. Uh, but thanks for that question, Christoph. All right, let's uh, taking a look at some of these questions that we have here. Yeah, in the meantime, I will reach another mm -hmm. option we, we, we are not talking yet. Uh, when we talk about the reactive or try to do trial and error, uh, there is also an option to go to the investigation space, which is basically you have a new feed and the people you don't know and you, you can also feed a little bit send this material to an, an university and the university can do the studies to give you the distribution, take samples, uh, get bulk size, etc. It's also we I used to do in Chile, Stanco have the same experience over Australia. And this is a, it's a good uh, predictive approach, but have some of the advantages, for example, take quite long you can get the, the samples, a size, and then the answer from the university. Sometimes can take three, four months. If the university is quick and everything is going well, maybe two months. And usually there is not the timing the traders do when, or they need when they are in a tender, for example, for a, a specific parcel of concentrate. And um, uh, also the university is not always came back with a, logic answer. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes there can be contamination in the samples. Sometimes just the skill of the person on the other side of the desk is not the best or many things can happen. And it's also it's an, it's an option. We used to do it. I believe I will keep doing. We just sent a sample for our university three or four weeks ago and give us a good idea about the, how much SPNL or olivine is in the feed and the slag, et cetera. But it's also, it's also something which um, is not quick enough in our point of view, and also doesn't help a lot from the design point of view when you have to extrapolate, uh, when you have to imagine, okay, I will have a feed with the double of the element I got now, and you virtually, you don't have the fit to, to do the slag, you have to estimate that. 
Yeah. And then a software like MPE is very useful for that. Yes, it is. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Um, so I'll grab uh, two of the questions that we have here that are on a similar theme. Uh, so we have one from Alison Imai and from Lloyd Nelson. Uh, so really these two questions are about asking about how close are we to equilibrium? Is there a gap between equilibrium and the actual results that we see? Uh, so the question is about then also comparing what we see in the isosmelt versus other furnaces. So when we look at uh, what's achieved in MP, it is a Gibbs free energy minimization software that then is assuming that equilibrium is present. Uh, so when we look at the isosmelts, and if you think back to the video that uh, Ben had before he crossed over to Oscar and myself, you saw that turbulent bath uh, with the bubbling, the submerged injection and the slag stirring everything around. That's what we normally see within the isosmelt process. Uh, we're very, uh, we, we use our control systems to make sure that we're very certain about the submergence of the lance within the molten bath to be able to generate the mixing that's needed. And when we look at the isosmelt reactor as uh, the products that it makes from, from the feed that's coming in the top, what we see is that we are near equilibrium. And that's why a package like uh, this one and the tool that Ben has demonstrated is actually so useful to us when it comes to then determining how can we treat these different types of feeds. Uh, now that's not to say that it can't be used in other circumstances. When you look at a more quiescent furnace, so let's say for the example that was asked here, which is uh, let's say an electric furnace, be it AC or DC, where we've looked at using MPE is to understand what happens at interfaces, because in those furnaces, in, uh, you normally uh, where you have equilibrium is that interface between phases. And that's where we really look at, okay, is there gonna be an interface forming between let's say a mat and a slag or a slag and an alloy? And we look at the percentage of solids. When we look at those solids, we then evaluate their density. And then that allows us to understand are you actually through processing a particular material forming a solid that is more dense than the slag but less dense than your metal or mat phase that then is going to start accumulating in that interface is that going to be a problem for your site and is that then a cause of what can be in some of those furnaces a mushy layer or another impediment to the whole furnace achieving equilibrium so I guess when you look at it, uh, what is it that you can achieve with this package? It really is that deeper understanding of what's happening. The advantage in the isosmelt, smelt, and for us, when we look at this sort of turbulent submerged injection reactor that we have, is that we can use those results in when evaluating feeds and different aspects. And uh, the extension to one of the questions is, well, what happens uh, when there are upset conditions or if the, there's a, a variability in the oxygen pressure or let's say the amount of feed to oxygen ratio has changed. Uh, that is something that we're then using to look at, well, when we consider our process, what happens then if we add more or less oxygen? How does that input or into the variability of the operation of our furnace? What are the other factors that we need to touch on? So if there's more oxygen, we'd look at that through the MP calculation and that would tell us, hey, with more oxygen, there's much more temperature. So therefore, when it comes to our uh, control system implementations, we then watch for these sort of temperature spikes. That actually means something's not going right. So we're gonna stop the process. We're gonna make sure everything is investigated right and to prevent uh, the situation occurring where there may be uh, problems in, in terms of the oxidation state of the slag or what's happening in the process itself. Um, so I hope that that helps answer uh, those two questions. So thank you, Alison and Lloyd for uh, sending those questions through. Yeah. Um... I will touch base with one of the questions here about the minor element distributions. Um, let me find we, who did the, ask the question. Uh, is John Radko? Yeah. Uh, the answer is yes. The John, the MPE can help you with understand the minor element distribution. Uh, they are the main ones, say the popular ones like arsenic, bismuth, antimony. Uh, lead uh, are incorporated in the database. 
the um, basically I, the MPE will show you how much is going to the metal faces can be a slag or mat and also how much it will go to the gases. Yeah. In general terms, we'll give you a good approach. Um, and also, as Stanko just said, if you change the oxygen enrichment, for example, your minor energy distribution will change as well. Mm -hmm. And you will be able to see that uh, from MPE. But in the practical way, we have to be careful with the, um, how we manage the recirculation inside the smelter. Because when you do a um, simulation of a minor element, the software will give you a good approach, what is going to happen, and, and also will consider some equilibrium. But if you change your feed or you change a process, change your distribution, um, you have to take care of what, what you are doing with the dust, for example. If you recirculate the dust uh, from secondary smelter or pyramid converters, this recirculation can change the overall uh, minor element distribution due to the changes in the feed, for example. Yeah. But the short answer is yes, we'll help you with minor element distribution, but we have to be careful because the minor element distribution will be good as a starting point, but then when your whole smelter will become in equilibrium with the river recirculation, dust recirculation, etc., you have to reevaluate the feed, assuming that the circulation is like a fresh element or another stream. That have to be um, careful about that, but MPE help you a lot to do this. Yeah, and I will touch base in a, in a contract question from the previous one. Mm -hmm. um, all the thing I told about the samples can be one minute, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but also the, the time which, which responds changing, for example, the silica, uh, it's also depending on how far is your beam, and how long is your conveyor system. Sometimes you can get a very quick answer from the size, but you will spend maybe 10, 20, 45 minutes, depending on how far is your beam and your speed, the speed of your conveyors and et cetera. It's all related. Um, uh, certainly you can get down to one minute, uh, maybe five to be realistic uh, with the variability in the guys, the crews, and also the cooling time, mm. how you're doing to take the sample you are taking with a plate, you're taking with a cup. Mm. You have to cool down one liter, you have to cool down 35 grams. It's different. But yeah, that is the, just to close up this uh, question. Excellent. Uh, I'll take this next one, which is from Mikhail M Milovanov. Uh, so his question here is what are the limitations of MPE? And I really think that's a great question because I think listening to us today and, and seeing what Ben has displayed, there, there will be a question in your mind as, is this too good to be true? And like any thermodynamic package, there are limitations associated with it. It doesn't have uh, every single element in the periodic table uh, within the actual database itself. Now here at Glencore Technology, we do sponsor the development of this database. So we are assisting for these elements to be added as we go through the years. And that's something that we really believe in here at, at uh, Glencore Technology to be able to, to fund this kind of work. Uh, we also do it uh, with the group at the University of Queensland for their databases. Uh, but when you look at these limitations, this is one of those things. It can't take everything into account. And I think that's one thing that Ben highlighted through his talk You've got to have that link back to operations. We have to be able to, to do these calculations and then predict what's going to be happening, but then also look at where will, how does that actually respond still in the field? We get that feedback from our operations team, and that really helps us understand how is this information being used? What will be uh, the next steps uh, for us to be able to then look at improving or changing our outcomes when it comes to recommendations to the team and in terms of what we can treat through these sort of plans. So even though uh, we may take get a sample and we'll put it through our model, uh, we're still going to be doing the part of, of checking and, and analyzing what is the outcome from treating this material. But the one advantage we have now is that it's not going to be done through a purely trial and error approach. 
we're going to be able to really approach this understanding how this material is going to impact our furnace, uh, but with the knowledge that we're still going to be attentive, we're still going to talk to the operations team and make sure that we are uh, able to address any of those limitations. So thanks very much, Mikhail, for that question. Yeah. I will answer the last question. We have to finish. Um, this question is from Hamed Hussein. My apologies for my pronunciation. I have a very strong Spanish accent. Um, Hamed, uh, that is a good one. I will say uh, the question for everyone is, is, is does MPE include features to we can provide warning of potential foam over seven events, lands, life impact, refractory wear, etc. MPE uh, at own, no, MPE just give you a thermodynamic calculation with some output. Yeah. But can be used for all the things you are talking about here. You can use MPE to predict and do changes in the real life and the operation space to maintain the bad temperature under the range you like or you want. MP also can help you to prevent foam, prevent foaming events. I will reach out to uh, my personal experience. Um, when I arrived to one specific operation within Glencore, one of the main issues was having these foam overs, say once a year. And one of my first jobs was to do the investigation to understand why this foam over happened. And after a long time, I will say, um, MPE give me the answers to understand why this form over happened and what we can do to prevent it. And the answer was long because we need to do a very deep investigation. It was a couple of months. And the improvement plan we have, actually we justify, I justify a, a construction of a new beam with the new conveyor system to add a, another flux to manage the slack quality. And since we did the discovery using MPE, uh, the feedback metallurgists start to add the flux in the bed, which is with the rest of the cone, and we prevent the foam overs. And the last one, I am glad to say, was in 2018 in June, which is now more than three years. And that was an outcome using the thermodynamic calculation and also give us the tool to go with the company say, hey, I need $2 million to do this job because I got this and happen, the good thing is within Glencore, our bosses, they know about MPE and they trust when we show the, the MPE model. Uh, there is not something like, oh, someone from the university told me I have to add more flags or these different flags. We show, okay, we have a proper software when we have confidence and the software is telling me I need to add one ton of something to prevent the foaming. And that happened. Uh, Hamed, thank you for the question. I believe we pretty much finished. Yep, that's right. So thanks very much to everyone for joining Oscar and me for this panel discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll pass back to uh, Ben Hogg, uh, who will uh, take you through this last part of the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, gents. Um, some good answers there and some great questions as well. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, if there are any questions we didn't get to, um, we'll respond to those um, in, a, in an email. Um, and you'll also get a link to a recording of today um, and a copy of the slides. Um, so on behalf of GT and the Isa Smelt team, thanks for your time today. Um, our details are on the screen now. Um, so if you've got any more questions, either email us there or on our personal emails. And uh, once again, appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.